Welcome to the Cannabis Compliance Updates for September 2022 in the Northeastern region. In Connecticut, a press release from the Consumer Protection announces new next steps for retailers, microcultivator lottery applicants. So the Department of Consumer Protection has opened the process for selected social equity applicants to proceed with the next steps in the license application review for retailers and microcultivator license types chosen through the social equity lottery. Three equity uh, joint venture applicants approved by the Social Equity Council has also been invited to proceed with the next steps in the licensure process. The department was notified that six retailer and two uh, microcultivator applications were approved by the Social Equity Council for satisfactory meeting the requirements approved by the General Assembly to qualify for social equity status. The applications represent the maximum number of social equity licenses available for each license type in the first lottery round. Additional licenses will be available in the future lotteries. The approved applicants and their backers have been asked to submit additional information for the required background check and provisional license application, which will be reviewed by DCP. The background check is conducted by a third-party processing company, and DCP's review of the applications is expected to take several weeks. Once the review is complete, qualifying applicants are required to pay the appropriate fees and move forward with the next phase of licensure, including establishing their business for operation. Remaining social equity applications uh, not selected in the social equity lottery will be added to the general lottery. The general lottery will be conducted by the Yukon School of Pharmacy in a manner similar to the social equity lottery after the DCP review of selected social equity applications is complete. The applicants for equity joint ventures are not subject to a lottery process. These applicants denied by the Social Equity Council may reapply. The law was amended this year to allow licensed DIA cultivators, medical producers, and medical dispensaries to create up to equity joint ventures, which are not subject to the lottery process. Cannabis was approved for adult use in June 2021. Adult use cannabis retail sales are anticipated to begin in the state around the end of 2022. For information about adult use cannabis, visit ct.gov backslash cannabis. And we got another one out of Connecticut. So this is just an article, Regional Cannabis, Taking a Note from Wine. Which is just great because we've talked about a lot of this in the Emerald Triangle as well, having like the Emerald Triangle be a region. So, um, but really there's like microclimates and things like that up there. So really there might even be like sub regions uh, between like Southern Humboldt, Northern Humboldt, Trinity, Mendocino. um, Because if you've ever been up there going from um, Mendocino to like Southern Humboldt, very, very different, uh, very, very different landscape. But Anyways, let's talk about this article. So in the past few years, growers have explored identifying geographic locations for areas where cannabis is grown, inspired by terror and application uh, designations in winemaking and agriculture more broadly. Terror is a term used in many industries such as hops, coffee, maple syrup, and chocolate to refer to the climate, soil, and other environmental conditions where product batches are cultivated. It is utilized to a heavy extent by the wine industry. Northern California has a lot of wine production. So those in the cannabis industry, which also has a strong history and foothold in the same area, migrate to the terminology and mentions of the geographic locations or designations that denote specific wine uh, growing regions. An appellation is a legally defined and protected geographic area to identify exactly where the grapes for wine were grown. So which of these terms or designations are most relevant regarding cannabis cultivation and how could incorporating them in cannabis labels benefit the industry? Ooh, that's an interesting comment. So um, just to kind of unpack that a little bit further in the experiences uh, that I've seen in Northern California. So it is a really big deal to say like, hey, this is from Mendocino or from Southern California or uh, Southern Humboldt, excuse me, in Northern California. And um, there is like a really big situation going on where 
you can't put on the label it was produced in that area unless if not only was it grown but also like extracted and processed in that area so for an example if you had a grow up in southern humboldt but then you go to process that down in like la which no idea why anyone would do that but if you did that and transported all of the cannabis in that manner then you can't say it's from Humboldt because it was processed in, uh, in LA. So like all of your licenses have to be in that area. Uh, another note on track and trace and things there. So before California implemented metric, Franwell's, you know, uh, seed to sale system, uh, they also had a different uh, system called SICPA or Cal, o yeah, Cal Origin, no. Cal something. It was called SICPA. S-I-C-P-A was the um, acronym. And that company was also a seed to sale company, but they uh, were from Switzerland and they tracked like banknotes and like other like highly regulated uh, items. And they actually had this uh, one, their tags were a lot smaller. They were like this big opposed to like this big, like a uh, metric tag. And uh, they also had a little QR code on them, which was really nice. And that QR code also had to be on the final form packaging. So that way, when the consumer receives that packaging, they can actually validate that that was from that specific area or Appalachia, uh, which I think was absolutely awesome and something I think that metric definitely needs to implement into their own system. But this is just unpacking some of these complications when it comes to uh, Appalachians and terrors and uh, where we're going to um, label where cannabis is from, similar to wine. So... Uh, terror is a French term utilized to describe geographic locations and environmental aspects, conditions, and influences that affect a plant's phenotype, which includes many factors ranging from soil composition and farming practices to elevation in the surrounding environment. Uh, terror is a, a, the principle behind the French appellation de or some French word, can't even. Uh, classification, which is a simple a system for wine regulation and appellation in France. Uh, the AOC designation is based on the idea that grapes yield distinct qualities that are specific to that geographic location and surrounding environmental influences. The importance of terror influence is a debated topic among the wine and other industries, as some wine experts do not agree uh, regarding the exact definition of terror, especially the influences of factors that are beyond the control of either the group growers or winemakers, such as ambient temp uh, temperatures, rainfall, etc. Some winemakers downplayed uh, its influence on taste and, and disagree regarding the exact definition of the term. Uh, Mark A. Matthews, a professor of viticulture and plant physiology at the University of California, Davis, described the concept of terror as a myth in his book, Terror and Other Myths of Wine Growing, yet he does agree that climate and geographic char characteristics have an influence on plant growth and the products these plants produce. He says the term is imprecisely defined and further states that the principles of uh, based on traditional belief rather than substantial by rigorous data or research. So some influences, pruning style, irrigation, harvest time, use of oak as well, uh, French versus American oak. That's a really big thing with like French wines. Uh, cultivator, uh, cultured or ambient versus laboratory produced yeast. Uh, length of uh, maceration in time and contact. So that's like more talking the wine situation. Okay, and then let's just take a look real quickly at Appalachian. So as noted before, an Appalachian is a legally defined and protected geographic location to identify exactly where the grapes for wine were grown. However, there are restrictions other than geographic par parameters, such as these types of grapes that may be grown maximum grape yields and alcohol content. Other quality aspects may be also apply before an Appalachian name may be legally be displayed on a wine, wine bottle label. The rules that govern Appalachians are dependent on the country where the wine was produced. 
the uh the US utilizes the American viticultural area and AVA is a designated wine grape growing region in the US that produces an official appellation to benefit both wineries and consumers. Wineries like to educate consumers about the geographic origin of their wines because grapes grown in a particular area have very distinctive qualities. Uh, educated consumers search for wines from specific AVAs as well as particular wines from certain AVAs. A certain bottle of wine from a disabled, uh, <laughs> desirable AVA can com uh, command premium prices and garner many loyal customers. Wow, that was difficult to get out. Okay, um, so what's going through my brain right now is... Me personally, I love Pinot Noir, um, but I love Pinot Noir from the Willamette Valley in Oregon. So whenever I'm in a store and I pick up red wine, that's what I'm looking for. Um, also, this article mentions like not backing it up with the data. Well, Huckleberry Hills up in Southern Humboldt, uh, they're actually doing a bunch of different studies comparing indoor grows and their outdoor grow with the same cultivar. Now, uh, there's definitely been a lot of, um, I don't exactly know what the word I'm looking for, uh, second guessing, I guess, of the data just because like what was the growing medium? What type of lights were used? Were there nutrients or not nutrients? Like there's so many factors when it comes to growing uh, cannabis. But what the preliminary data uh, points are saying is that there's a higher terpene content in cannabis that's grown outdoors, uh, probably just because of the full spectrum of the sun. And it's my assumption. Uh, so just keep that in mind that we have a long way to go with all of this data, but I do love that the conversations around Appalachians are happening, uh, especially now that we have like Vermont and the Northeast uh, opening up because from a latitude standpoint, they are, I want to say like right there, like Southern Humboldt is. And uh, back in the day in college, I used to work at a winery and the winery I used to work at was a French winery in Pennsylvania. And actually the climate was starting to change to be more like the French type of Appalachian. So uh, all in all, really interesting. Uh, keep an eye on it. I think that this is going to be really great to see in the future on uh, Appalachians. All right. Another one out of Connecticut. Familiar names among Connecticut's uh, retail and micro cultivation lottery winners. So we just went over this a little bit, but a few repeat winners appeared among the general lottery winners for six retail and two micro cultivation cannabis provisional licenses announced by Connecticut's Department of Consumer Protections, DCP. On Thursday, the general lottery included all applicants, including social equity applicants that were either not selected or were deemed ineligible for social equity status. In the case of the microcultivation, there are 8,561 applicants in total. There were a total of 15,621 retail applications, making it appear incredibly unlikely for any entity to win more than once. But that is because single entities were allowed to submit multiple applications, which is mind boggling. Uh, in theory, a single company could have filed 5,000 of the 15,621 retail applications, though they would have had to pay $500 lottery fee for each bid for the particular license type. The state is still reviewing applications, but the Department of Consumer Protection is play planning to release the number of applicants that each entity submitted. That's just asking for a lawsuit. No idea why they allowed them to have multiple applications in when there's a lottery, but... You know, we're learning. All right. Another uh, update. This one is out of Massachusetts. Massachusetts has a political veteran for a new DC CCC chair, not DCP, <laughs> CCC chair. <laughs> So the Massachusetts Cannabis Commission finally has a new chair with the current state treasurer's appointment for former treasurer Shannon O'Brien to the head of the Bay State's top cannabis authority. The state treasurer, currently Deborah Goldberg, has the sole authority to appoint the Cannabis Control Commission chair. The position requires experience in corporate management, finance, and securities, but there is no requirement for experience in cannabis. Sorry. Can't help but laugh. 
Umbreed's selection ranked a few activists and business owners because of her lack of experience in cannabis. On the other hand, both of Obreen's predecessors, Stephen Hoffman and interim chair Sarah Kim, lacked cannabis experience. Three of the original five commissioners, including Hoffman, lacked experience in the industry, explained David O'Brien, president of the Massachusetts Cannabis Business Association. No relation to um, the new chair. Shannon O'Brien is a veteran of state politics, having served in both houses of the state legislator before becoming state treasurer in 1999. So Breen is taking the reins as, a, as the CCC is starting a new round of rulemaking to adhere to the recently passed cannabis reform omnibus bus bill, <laughs> which Governor Charlie Baker signed into law on August 11th. As per the new law, the CCC will now have increased oversight of host community agreements between cannabis operators and municipalities. The law creates a method for towns and cities to opt in to allowing social consumption licenses. It also calls for the creation of a social equity fund to create financing opportunities, and it requires municipalities to prior prioritize social equity applicants while also redirecting excise tax funds. Uh, Steve Hoffman, who was the state's first CCC chair, abruptly resigned from his position in April with three months left on his five-year term. Since then, Sarah Kim, the state treasurer's general counsel, has served as interim director. Okay, we got another one out of Massachusetts. New Massachusetts marijuana reform law targets diversity and municipality fees. So high level, Ava Calendar uh, of the Massachusetts Cannabis Control Commission told reporters that she was Quote, shaking with relief and happiness after the, after the governor recently signed sweeping legislation focused on improving diversity and equity in the state's two billion cannabis industry. The law, which took years of advocacy, will create a social equity trust fund to help entrepreneurs raise capital and will limit the controversial fees levied by municipalities on local cannabis businesses. The law, which took years of advocacy, will create a social equity trust fund to help entrepreneurs raise capital and will limit the controversial fees levied by the municipalities on local cannabis businesses. Exciting stuff. All right. Now, switching gears on over to New Jersey. All right. So highlights from New Jersey's Cannabis 2022 proposed new cannabis rules. This is coming from Vicente Cedarberg. You all know that, that I love this law firm. So on August 1st, 2022, New Jersey's Cannabis Regulatory Commission, CRC, released proposed personal use regulations that readopt and supplement the CRC's initial per personal use regulations released in August 2021. The provisional rules. These rules implement the Cannabis Regulatory Enforcement Assistance and Marketplace Modernization, uh, the CREAM Act, and include rules for wholesalers, distributors, and delivery services, and include a new restriction on license ownership among family members. It's a very interesting one. The public comment period for these proposed regulations closed on September 30th, 2022. Industry stakeholders may submit written comments to uh, right here, newjersey.gov backslash cannabis backslash pros propose dash updated dash rules. Um, so a few things. So the timeline, the rules do not have an immediate effect. These rules are subject to the requirements of public comment prior to adoption of the public comment period uh, will expire September 30th term in Final rules, the provisioning rules will remain in effect until their expiration on February 15, 2023, at which point the new rules and amendments could take effect. Notable changes. So limitation of one cannabis license per family, a spouse, domestic partner, cultivation, uh, union partner, child, sibling, or parent of the license applicant, applicant may not be an owner of another license applicant or license holder. Uh, regulations. So real quick, uh, just going back to Connecticut and this, all this wonkiness with their licensing and how you could submit multiple applications. Like here they are. Some people were trying to like skirt this system, you know, by, um, having like a parent and a child and a sibling, like all apply for a license. And then like, they're all separate entities and separate owners, but obviously not. So I like that uh, New Jersey's making this a bit more stringent. 
regulations uh, clarifying micro business operations and restrictions. And so micro business here is like the true definition of a micro business, unlike California, uh, where it has to be a specific amount of square feet and they can only wholesale so much product uh, within a month as a retailer. Uh, detailed guidance on the destruction of cannabis waste. Revisions to uh, transaction limits, thank goodness. Removal of logo size limitations uh, for you know the logo on uh, packaging and labeling and things like that. Uh, so what wasn't addressed? No changes to the types of edibles that are allowed in the manufacturers uh, to be manufactured or sold. Vicente, I don't like that you use edibles here because technically edibles aren't allowed, but it's like capsules. Um, but that's just me being particular. No changes to the uh, prohibition on alternate business name DBAs, which is also a really big one. So if you're not familiar with this, it, um, if I create an LLC, bar consulting LLC, I can't use a DBA on that. All like my sign on my retail storefront, all of my labels, everything has to say bar consulting LLC. And that's also challenging because you might not want like cannabis or marijuana or something like that in the name. And you might th want to use that as a DBA uh, just to help with like different transacting things because we know how challenging it is for us for cannabis businesses. But anyways, um, and then no guidance included for consumption lounges. So high level, that's what's happening in New Jersey. Thank you for Vicente Cedarberg for this awesome update. All right. New Jersey Cannabis Regulatory Commission issues guidance on workplace impairment determinations. So uh, New Jersey Governor Phil Murphy signed the New Jersey, the CREAM Act, uh, which amended the New Jersey Constitution to legalize recreational cannabis. The law allows employers to conduct numerous forms of drug testing for cannabis, but limits an employer's ability to uh, rely on positive cannabis test results in making employment decisions. It requires that a drug test include both scientifically reliable objective testing methods and procedures, such as testing of blood, urine, or uh, saliva, and a, quote, physical evaluation. Instead, of instead, on September 9th, 2022, the commission released interim guidance to assist employers with making, quote, work workplace impairment determinations. In the guidance, the commission highlighted the, new the need for employers to establish evidence-based protocols for documenting observed behavior and physical signs of impairment, to develop reasonable suspicion, and then to utilize a drug test to verify whether or not an individual has used an impairing substance in recent history. The guidance advises that employers can continue to utilize established protocols for developing reasonable suspicion for impairment and using the documentation paired with evidence like a drug test to make the determination that an individual violated a drug-free workplace policy. Still going to be a bit challenging since cannabis stays in your system for so long, but... All right, in New York... Another one from Vicente. So on August uh, 12, 2022, New York announced the application window for conditional adult use retail dispensary licenses, which will be the first batch of adult use uh, retail licenses released in New York. The current applications will be available through September 26, 2022. Um, here they even have compliance tips in a webinar series for you. And I think this is on their YouTube channel too, if you want to search for Vicente Cedarberg there. Uh, testing laboratory emergency regulations. The Cannabis Control Board issued emergency regulations for testing laboratories and sampling firms. Um, and then some testing laboratory permit applications, sampling firm applications, and then packaging and labeling advertising guidance issued for conditional processors and cultivators. So... A lot happening in New York. Excited to see that market get opened up. All right. Let's keep talking New York. So New York cannabis regulators make the environment a top priority for all licenses. 
So to help New York cannabis industry entrepreneurs get the business off the for the right foot, VS's uh, New York team created an eight-part series of VS Insights to assist in navigating the path of applying for a New York cannabis license. Uh, part seven of the series focuses on New York environmental requirements for cannabis operators. So some high things for cultivators, greenhouse gas emissions, waste reduction, sourcing organic principles and waste, water reduction, manufacturing and retailers. Under the proposed regulations, licensees have a few options for meeting these sustainable requirements. Options include uh, purpose reuse uh, strategies for collecting reusable cannabis packaging components to be sanitized and refilled to or reused as cannabis packaging. Love that. The retail packages will need to be sanitized and disinfected by a licensee or by a third party to ensure that they are in good condition and do not contain any harmful residue or contaminants, which means you also need a really good product recall plan to like prepare against this. The licensee must outline a sustainable packaging strategy that uses non-plastic comp compostable or recyclable materials or packaging materials that exceed 25% post-consumer recycled content. In addition, there are annual report requirements for licenses who package product, products for retail sale. The licenses must annually report any metrics, including but not limited to the total number of packaging materials by weight sold, offered by sale, or distributed into the state by the licensee in prior calendar year, and then the total cost of packaging material. What can they expect moving forward? Final regulations and additional guidance. Proposed legislation. How can you say in compliant with the environmental regulations? The most important thing with compliance, both environmental and general, is to stay on top of your game. Look uh, to not only the Cannabis Regulatory Agency for guidance, but also the DEC. Be on the lookout for new FAQ guidance, regulations, or comments from re regulators that may indicate changes are coming. Create checklists that you can easily reference. Absolutely. When in doubt, ask your inspector for help. Ask your legal team or compliance consultant for guidance. Cool. All right. And we got another one in New York. A, and I think this is our last one out of New York. A consensus builds for a crackdown on illegal cannabis shops, though not on how to do it. So... State and city lawmakers are alarmed by rapid rise of unlicensed cannabis uh, sales ahead of the launch of the legal adult use market. Pressure and building for New York's cannabis regulators and officials to address ballooning unregulated cannabis sales across the state. Lawmakers passed the Marijuana Regulation and Taxation Act last year. It decriminalized cannabis possession and set the state on a path forward, path toward legal adult use cannabis sales in the coming months. But meanwhile, ahead of the launch in, of the legal industry, illegal sales have become increasingly commonplace, from converted food trucks that advertise cannabis products in neon lights to brazen store fronts with fully stocked shelves. In many of these places, a consumer purchases something like a sticker or t-shirt and then is given a cannabis in addition to that item. Uh, in this way, the cannabis is not being directly purchased. Some of these entities even claim to be licensed through cannabis regulars have issued zero licenses and the don't use cannabis sales. So yeah, this is like that donation loop around whatever. Um, you saw it in DC, you saw it in California. It's funny that people do this, but it is what it is. Um, the, and what's also interesting is I can't remember. It was either the governor or it was the mayor of New York city, like straight up said, like go buy weed, like when there was nowhere to buy it. So of course, like you as an authority figure saying this to the general public, when they don't know the ins and outs of licensing and what this means, like, come on, what a dumb statement. But, uh, anyways, nothing new here. Um, yeah, nothing new here. This always happens in new markets. All right, two more updates for you out in the northeastern region. Just a really quick one for Pennsylvania. We got an updated pesticide list. Um, so this is from ProCanna. Just take a look at that for Pennsylvania.
And then my last update for you is out of uh, Vermont. So the Cannabis Control Board approved its first batch of retail established licenses today, September 14th, 2022, to the following applicants and two and a half weeks ahead of schedule. So Mountain Girl Cannabis and Flora Cannabis, uh, Champion Valley Dispensary Inc., uh, Cersei's Med, Cerse is included in the list as a integrated license. Integrated licenses may engage in activities that are allowed under all current adult use licenses, including retail sales. These businesses are currently licensed as dispensaries under Vermont's medical use program and now engage in adult use sales. While these approvals mark a turning point in the road for a more sensible adult use marketplace, it is important to note that it is not the end of the journey. The board recognizes that delays in the initial licensure, licensure for applicants, especially Vermont's outdoor cultivators, means not everyone will be able to fully engage with the market this year, which in turn will create early supply shortages, also standard in new markets. A similar dynamic has occurred in the initial rollout of each adult use state and as the supply chain develops, the CCP's licensing team remains hard at work uh, reviewing applicant applications for all license types and the board will continue to approve them on a rolling basis. This market will take time to equalize, but today's licensing decisions, we have taken an important step towards creating something that can truly benefit Vermonters. How exciting. Congratulations, Vermont. And there are your compliance updates for the Northeastern region in September 2022.